thank you for having me here today. Thanks to the ODI team and the CDKN team. As Tom said, I'll be presenting some of the findings from a report that we did in partnership with CDKN called Resilience in Action, Lessons Learned from Public-Private Collaborations Around the World. And there are also a few copies uh, sort of on the right-hand side of the room, and this is also available online. Just to give a brief overview of what our project aim to do, uh, the research aims to demonstrate how innovative public-private public collaborations uh, can <coughs> include both formal and informal disaster risk management and adaptation collaborations, and uh, also how such collaborations can build resilience in communities, economies, and businesses. So what we did is we uh, did a global scan of innovative collaborations around the world um, and identified a couple of particularly interesting case studies to um, sort of extract from there some of the lessons learned um, that would be applicable to decision makers and policy makers um, and to review some of their challenges and opportunities uh, by conducting interviews with uh, several of the entities involved in uh, these partnerships. And then uh, this is also meant to, as I said, support decision makers um, that are seeking to engage and support collaboration uh, with the private sector. So uh, from our giant scan that we did, we identified nine case studies. Uh, you can see it in this slide here. Those shaded blue are uh, the countries that we covered in our case studies. I'm only going to highlight a couple today. and. Uh, you can see so all of Sub-Saharan Africa is highlighted. One of our case studies was a regional uh, partnership. So some of the key lessons learned um, and insights for decision makers and policy makers, I'll uh, walk through those now for you. The first thing is it's really important to understand the private sector's motivation to become involved in DRM. Um, and you can sort of classify that in terms of uh, the private sector is either looking to mitigate risks or take advantage of opportunities, and those could be internal risks, um, you know, relating to sort of company revenues, their assets and operations, um, or they could be external risks that apply to, you know, their supply chain, customers, and the community. Likewise, there's sort of some internal opportunities and external opportunities. And so, uh, as a decision maker, it's important, if you're trying to engage the private sector, it's important to understand why they would want to be interested in uh, what are the ways in which you can attract them uh, to partner with you. So a couple of examples, you know, supply chain resilience building projects um, would mitigate some internal, internal risks um, from a revenue stream perspective, but also some of the external risks of the supply chain, something that uh, private sector is, you know, a given company is less able to control on their own. Another quick example would be sort of micro enterprise incubation initiatives um, really sees an external opportunities as well as that inner circle should be shaded as well as um, uh, some internal uh, business growth opportunities as well. So again, decision makers looking to engage the private sector should also really know sort of what are some of the hot spots of activity. Uh, we've identified four areas in particular, uh, financial services, so access to finance and microloans um, for small businesses, weather-based index insurance are areas where we're seeing a lot of private sector uh, activity and um, sort of collaborations with the uh, public and private sector. Agriculture is also an area where there are a lot of uh, collaborations relating, um, in particular, we found several interesting examples relating to access to fertilizer and irrigation. Um, finding ways um, in which uh, farmers can um, sort of grow their harvests given the changing climate patterns uh, and conditions. Uh, and then uh, the ICT area, you know, particularly a lot of information, <coughs> a lot of partnerships around information exchange platforms, uh, you know, gathering and sharing weather information or market information in particular. And then we're also seeing a lot of activities in the water sector, uh, both from the perspective of uh, water management as it relates to sort of agriculture and industrial manufacturing from sort of the, c the conservation side as well as uh, drinking water uh, and providing sort of low cost access to water um, and sort of inter interesting distribution solutions and I'll highlight one of those examples briefly. So as I said earlier, we 
um, identified a series of case studies um, and from those extracted some lessons learned that are really relevant. So now I will highlight a couple, a couple examples um, and we'll walk through sort of who was involved, what the project entailed and sort of the associated sectors and then what countries or regions um, that it focused on. And uh, I have three examples and I'll walk through the first one now, which was with Deutsche Post uh, DHL has a program called GARD, Getting Airports Ready for Disaster. And this program is one that they partnered with local governments uh, and uh, the United Nations Development Program and uh, several local humanitarian relief agencies in order to run a very <coughs> robust disaster management training program for airport personnel. And uh, this project is really, the program is really interesting because it's been replicated and scaled um, several times, um, you know, on many continents, <coughs> Nepal and Bangladesh, El Salvador, Indonesia, Lebanon, Turkey, and my understanding is there also some opportunities for other countries have become interested in trying to run these types of programs and trainings at their airports um, as well, uh, you know. So what were some of the key learnings um, and success factors for this project? Well walk through them here, uh, you know, airports are key hubs for uh, disaster relief as well as also for response um, afterwards. And um, this program really focused on from the design of uh, trying to make it really replicable and scalable. Uh, they started really small at a single location in airport and from that they've been able to replicate it throughout um, throughout the different airport region, airports uh, within a given countries and then also scale it uh, in terms of the number of people trained. Uh, but despite focusing on the replicability and scalability in its design, the, the sort of Deutsche Post DHL has also worked really closely with local governments and regulators um, to build trust and knowledge before rolling out the program. But also, you know, they all have different approaches and protocols um, with regards to how airports are managed and really worked really closely with them to tailor it so that the training uh, would work well at the given site. Um, additionally, airports have sort of a lot of personnel there and a lot of turnover. Um, they've, the program has been designed um, so that it, it'll be repeated um, to have sort of advocates within it who can run trainings and ongoing education as uh, staff sort of cycles through. Um, and this has sort of com created some institutionalization within uh, several of the airports with regards to, uh, you know, how they should be prepared for uh, disasters um, as they strike. The second example I have for you is the Mwanza Rural Housing Program. Uh, this is an interesting program that focuses on building flood resilience. And it's engaged uh, local brick making enterprises, uh, individual uh, people in search of jobs um, and needing skill development, local NGOs, uh, the Department of Community Development in Tanzania, and the Ashton and ERM foundations. What it's done is, so the Mwanza region is pro very highly prone to flooding. Uh, the homes tend to, uh, sort of oftentimes are destroyed each year um, when the floods come um, because of how the mud bricks are created. And so this results in you know, a lot of economic losses. Um, and so the Mwanza Rural Housing Program worked together with uh, local government uh, to develop a training program for brick, the brick making industry to make bricks that aren't going to wash away as easily in a storm and will last longer. And what's interesting about this program is that they work together with uh, the agricultural industry, which had waste uh, that wasn't being used so that they could fuel their kilns and um, for the brick making and sort of connecting two different sectors um, and providing opportunities for both of them. So um, some of the key success factors as I highlighted, you know, in particular, this program has been uh, successful because they've created synergistic relationships between the rice, the rice farmers and the brick makers. Rice farmers get an additional revenue stream by selling their waste husks and the brick makers have lower costs 
uh, for fuel for their kilns by uh, being able to purchase from them um, and having sort of a resource that's close by and readily available rather than having to travel long distances for fuel. Um, also, another success factor of this program and something really relevant for policymakers seeking to develop collaborations with the private sector is um, it's important to make sure collaborations evolve as the beneficiaries do. So initially, um, this training program really focused on manufacturing support and training on how the brickmakers could make this new style of brick. And over time, they um, have focused on helping grow the business and providing different skills to help them grow the business, their businesses. And finally, allowing profitable projects and programs to spin off um, and as they become more profitable. And, grow. and my final example is the clean drinking water distribution program through water kiosks, uh, which has been uh, run in Zambia. And it's basically a partnership with a commercial utility, kiosk operators, KFW, and the Devolution Trust Fund. And it's a partnership where commercial utilities and their village entrepreneurs have created like a series of decentralized water kiosks and um, have used those to provide um, clean water access in areas where uh, infrastructure can't be built or it's too expensive to build infrastructure. This program has been really successful because they have, um, through work with the public sector and the private sector, they've eliminated upfront costs um, and made it really accessible for entrepreneurs to get the kiosks. They're free. Um, they just have, uh, they pay them back sort of over time. Um, but up front, they don't have to invest, they don't have big startup costs. And then this is also area for policymakers to keep in mind is this a program where infrastructure access has been linked with skill building by providing all these trainings, um, focusing on women in particular on how to run their own water kiosks. Additionally, the water kiosks are allowed to uh, sell other things other than water, creating multiple revenue streams. So, thank you so much. Over to you, Dan.